There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. I had um, uh, an avid interest in theosophy, which is, you know, esoteric occult literature um, from about my mid twenties. And uh, I was reading that for, you know, it must have been uh, 15 plus years before I came across DMT and, uh, you know, the notion of a spirit molecule really piqued my interest and, um, Growing up in the north of England, working class background, you know, access to acid and then MDMA and rave culture. And it kind of all kind of came together, having seen the Spirit Molecule documentary and, and then tried DMT and, and, and kept on trying it. And, you know, after multiple experiences and a determination to understand what was going on. It kind of, it, it was then it drew the esoteric and occult literature that I've been reading in, into that equation. And, um, you know, a couple of books later, I'm here and already, you know, researching for my third book. Since the beginning of our time, man has used substances to alter his mind. Tobacco has been smoked since around 5,000 years BC, its origins in early Mesoamerica. Alcohol has been drunk since a similar period in time, its first evidence traced to ancient Persia in modern-day Iran. But to truly open the mind, man needed to involve hallucinogens. The Mayans drank Spanish ash mixed with honey which was known as balche, imbibed in group rituals to achieve a trance state. The Olmec, Zapotec and the Aztecs took naturally found substances such as mescaline from the peyote cactus, psilocybin from mushrooms and lysergic acid from ololiuki seeds. Indeed, there is evidence that taking peyote dates back to around 5,000 years BC too, and mushrooms to 3,000 years BC. So the notion of using external influences to change the impulses within the mind are older than most of what we know in our world, it predates most of the lasting evidence we still have from those times. The cloths and pottery and artwork, the buildings and the tombs and the writings. It predates the pyramids by nearly 2,000 years. It could be said, therefore, that our modern mind and 21st century brain has evolved into one which is perfectly tuned to connect with such things, and that whatever realms such hallucinogens open up within us or around us are as much a part of us as any other external factor. We each have cell membrane receptors in our brains to regulate and accept cannabinoids, the compounds found exclusively in the cannabis plant and its derivatives. It's in our genetic makeup. One such substance that has been used in shamanic practices in Central and South America since the pre-Columbian period of Mesoamerica is dimethyltryptamine, known more commonly as DMT. Naturally occurring in many plants and animals, it's known for its quick onset and big hitting power whilst maintaining quite a short trip. It can last 15 minutes if smoked, or up to a few hours if eaten with another substance, and is making what can only be described as a comeback in recent years, giving psychonauts the next level of progress to other states of consciousness. Known colloquially as the spirit molecule, DMT can take its user on a wild trip to alternate realities, providing glimpses and full encounters with extraterrestrial existences, meetings with otherworldly beings or entities, and the ability to see things that are more real than reality itself. It provides the power to look at oneself internally, 
to analyse the way you are and the things you do in ways that you have never done before, offering life-transforming decision-making and reckoning. Alternatively, it can strip away what curtain we seemingly have drawn around our own abilities to see the world through truly open eyes, showing that there are entities here, beyond description, moving around our world and interacting with us every day, just beyond our understanding or recognition. At the front of the pack in the field of DMT research is Dick Kahn, a writer and frequent psychonaut with such things. He has begun to dig into the other planes of consciousness which seemingly open up when DMT is taken. Dick joins us tonight for a frank and honest take on the experience and about how it is one of history's oldest methods to peer beyond the veil. Especially as a... A youngster, you know, I had, um, I guess, what medically would be called very pronounced tinnitus, and I've always had it. I have it now. I can hear it as we're speaking. But as a youngster, I mean, it was really pronounced, and I thought everybody had this, and I couldn't understand why, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and, you know, my, my parents would give me my breakfast, and I'm like, I, I'm thinking, because I didn't have the speech, but I'm thinking, <clears throat> why, why are they not talking about that sound in the head? And that sound in the head, I focused on it and I had some really bizarre experiences such as uh, feeling uh, very, extremely tiny relative to the size of the bedroom. And then that would transform and I would feel massively out of proportion, like way bigger beyond the boundary, the dimensions of the bedroom. And that was really a, a regular occurrence, but more unusually, some classic out-of-body experiences, maybe three or four, such a magical experience, uh, one that I, I wished I could control. It, it was the kind of experience that I, when I'd had it, I'd, I'd want it again and again. But that came about through willfully fighting sleep, uh, you know, and it, it, it took some doing, and I, I didn't know where I was going for it. I, I, you know, as a child, I just wanted, it sounds daft, but I wanted to be awake and conscious at the time that I fell asleep to see what it was like. And that kind of willful battle eventually saw some aspect of me vacate my body and, and transport, just move around the house just by dint of will, going through closed wooden doors and seeing the house just as it was and everybody's in bed. And, and I do put these down now to maybe, I don't know, heightened levels of DMT or maybe a, a very active pineal body at a young age. But waking up convinced it was Christmas Day one morning, opening the curtains and seeing what resembled a, a, a sunshine at the foot of the garden, you know, glowing brilliantly. And I was transfixed by this thing. You know, I, I was mesmerised by it. And when I did get to steal myself away to drag my mum upstairs to see this, this sunshine, it had gone. And I, and I found it wasn't Christmas morning. It was the middle of a very hot summer. And uh, yeah, I, you know, that's, that's something I've thought about quite often since pursuing DMT. Because I, I don't know, I, I feel blessed that I had such a, an amazing experience at a young age. Do you feel that? Obviously, some of these experiences predate the, the research into, into DMT, that you are predisposed in some way to be more um, either open and, and receptive to these things when they happen, or perhaps more prone to having such experiences for whatever reasons. I, I do, but I qualify that very quickly by saying I think there's a uh, a lot of people that are also equally predisposed. I mean, as a result of publishing a couple of books, I've, I've managed to interact with a whole range of people from all across the world. And having these kinds of experiences, you know, it's not unique to me. They're, they're pretty common. I mean, even family members have told me things that happened to them when they were very young. And then at school, you hear, you know, you hear all kinds of stories about, Ouija board say or ghost story I mean even my dad had a great ghost story and he, he was not a man to suffer fools gladly but he'd seen this ghost at 14 with a, a friend of his and you know years later I, I got to speak to this friend of his when they were both you know 
old men and this guy told the self same story as my old man so i think a lot of people are predisposed to this whatever we want to call the you know hidden nature the phenomena whatever we call it you know that there's something there hidden from our senses that's as real as this if not real or whatever that means what's fascinating about the, the, the behind your question is what shapes that culture that keeps us conditioned into disbelieving or, or not tuning into that or not entertaining those ideas and that's a really fascinating question i don't pretend i know the i the answer to it but it's a really fascinating question about you know the, the cultural drivers that shape our thinking When I was doing my research, before I tried DMT, I'd read about these tribes people in the Amazon and, and drinking ayahuasca, and they were saying it, it puts them in touch with the spirits of the forest. And you know what? Shame on me, even with all my sort of esoteric and occult beliefs about unseen realities and, and unseen entities. I kind of read that or, or heard that, and I kind of poo-pooed it. I thought, yeah, you know, put, putting in touch with the spirits of the forest, I'll bet. But man absolutely you know i mean absolutely correct you know but yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's one of those things even with my belief in in spirits and unseen realities based on what i'd read it wasn't until i'd not only tried dmt but pursued it and pursued it and pursued it to try and come to some understanding as to what was happening that i, I realized oh my god yeah something is interacting with me. This is not my mind working under its own steam. Something's imposing upon me and, and, and directing a very bizarre and, and what's proved to be life-changing experience. And that's just not for me. That's pretty much anybody who tries it, you know, in it, yeah. it, its full capacity. It's a life changer. Obviously it started, I'm presuming, and correct me if I'm wrong here, as, as more of a recreational experience and then you started to to kind of open some doors that you you wanted to look through in a bit more depth is that am i um, wrong no i wouldn't say it was ever recreational but it's interesting you used that phrase because it was i was going through a phase where i'd, I'd stopped smoking weed i i you know i'd stopped smoking cigarettes and you know i was pursuing research chemicals which were legally available online and these were analogs of mdma and some of them like extremely powerful, you know, really good. And my, my boys were young enough for me to be able to get away with staying up all night, Saturday night and going, you know, the length of Sunday before I hit bed. And it was, you know, a chance to the spirit molecule documentary that blew my mind, did a lot of research, bought the back, had a psychedelic experience with, with um, some psychedelic truffles. And then, it was pure curiosity that wanted to make me try the spirit molecule. I wouldn't say recreational. I mean, when I tried it and it was in this room, my wife was overseeing me and I didn't really know how to smoke it. So it was just, it wasn't a breakthrough dose as they call it, but the crystals were fresh and, and, and the intake just, the, you know, what I smoked. Wow. I mean, the power of it is just incredible and, and from that very moment because what it did it the, the very first effect that i noted why it was unmissable is that tinnitus that I, i've explained that's been with me all my life it was like the volume the intensity turned right up and and straight away it, i was enamored by it i was like wow what is this substance The significance of that tinnitus to me as a young boy, I can't emphasize enough how, how important it was in my early childhood. So, you know, cue some like decades later, I smoke this substance and it really turns it up. I was like, wow, what is this? I'd had quite a few experiences, you know, I'd, I'd gone sort of, you know, the, the first threshold dosed in here and then a, a light dose in the bedroom which was magical and then the next the third attempt was what's commonly called a breakthrough dose and had you know multiple breakthrough doses after that you know I'm not talking about doing it daily but uh, yeah so I'd had quite a few experiences and it, it, I, the more I tried it the more I was like what is going on it's just 
beyond words, you know, you're seeing impossible things, you're having bizarre experiences. Can you tell us a little bit about, about one or two of them? Yeah, so, you know, come home in the bedroom. It's uh, And I'm very much an eyes open person with this. So in the bedroom, laid on the bedroom floor, curtains open, daylight outside, smoke a dose, lay back. And then something is clearly in the room. You can, you can sense it, you can feel it. But not only that, the airspace within the room has taken on a, a very dense... Uh, beige, transparent, you know, atmosphere. I mean, it's unmissable, you know, it's like it's like there's something there. The atmosphere is now beige. And then all of a sudden that 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 thing filling the airspace within the room, it would just shatter. But it makes the bedroom look like it's shattered into shards. So I mean, when I, I had that experience, I was like, my God, the, the bedroom shattered. That's how it looks. But as I've progressed, I've come to realise that the thing filling the, the bedroom is a non-physical entity and its capacity to do all kinds of wondrous tricks uh, includes the ability to sort of, you know, um, present itself in a kind of crizzled, shard manner that makes it look like the bedroom's, you know, finished. So, yeah, I mean, experiences like that and then, I don't know. I was. I mean, I, I was pretty happy with myself. I always felt like I always, I felt like I wanted to do something. And I didn't know what it was. And I've been feeling this for quite a long time. And I'd wanted to write about, you know, uh, esoteric and occult literature based on what I'd read. I didn't really I, I wanted to, but I didn't I wasn't sure I had the sort of depth of, of knowledge and understanding. And I don't know, I, I got really taken by the DMT experience to the extent that, I don't know, it, the experience has made me feel obliged to make some lifestyle changes. So I'm gonna cut out drinking and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my own research program. You know, I believe I can do that. And I'm gonna set my stall out to understand what's going on with these crazy experiences. So that uh, that was the point at which I started recording my um, experiences and really, really throwing myself at it to try and understand what was going on. At that point, no intention to write a book until, I don't know, it could have been weeks or a few months later, and I just chanced upon Stephen Fry at an awards ceremony, uh, applauding, but also encouraging writers to, you know, if you're pushing forward, you're a, an author or a script writer or, you know, whatever, and you're trying to, you know, press ahead in that industry, believe in yourself, do it kind of thing. And, and I saw that and, and I said, you know what, I'm going to write a book. And from that moment, no looking back, it was pure determination. So that's really how it came together. So let's get into the kind of, the nitty gritty of this a little bit. What do you think is going on? So you've, you've, you've taken your hit, <clears throat> you've pushed your consciousness somewhere. You've, you've opened the door, you've opened the window and you've either allowed yourself through or you've allowed something through the other way or potentially both. What are you, what are your theories? What have you no. must have kind of formed? I'm really glad that you, you mentioned that, that first part, which is, you know, you, you've put your consciousness out there because the, the initial effects of DMT is it, it will, and there's various ways we can explain this. It amplifies, it expands, it enlarges, it projects, it pushes out, but essentially some aspect of you, immaterial aspect of you or, or relatively immaterial, whether we call it consciousness or mind stuff or astral fluid, whatever you want to call it, but something will project bubble-like from your being. It seems it's coming from the head. And the significance of that is, and people talk about set and setting, the significance of that is you have significantly altered your setting by that mind stuff projecting outward. And it would seem it serves as a, a signal that is attractive to a whole host of powerful non-physical beings. And in my experience, what will typically happen is one such being will very quickly emerge within your setting, 
whether you're indoors or outdoors and within sometimes it seems like it's instantaneous but it's extremely quickly it's going to manifest in your setting it's going to impose its own power upon you and it's going to I, I've, I've kind of gone down this path of saying it's going to mesmerically overpower you and, and I you know I choose the word mesmerically you know based on my research but it, it is it's it's overpowering you and it's mesmerizing you and whilst you're engulfed within its 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 body it's able to impose all kind of visual wonders upon you that does make it look like you've gone to another realm another place another planet now within that that entity can create i don't know if it wants to create clowns it's going to create clowns jesters dragons whatever you know the, the entities are not the visual constructs the entity is the powerful non-physical being that's imposing upon you and i guess sharing its imagination with you and i've seen all amazing things from from beautiful landscapes to strange human-like entities that appear as though they were wearing masks to little yellow-like minions clowns circus performers i'm saying they're not the entities when i smoke dmt i'm not suddenly appearing in a, a circus somewhere in another dimension i'm saying something very powerful is imposing upon me and it's imposing its own imaginative fancies upon my heightened visual perceptions it it looks like you are in another world it's not that i'm seeing something there and here's my bedroom you're engulfed within it wherever you look you you're within that that yeah. body of that being so what is it that that tells you that it is something other than just a auditory and visual hallucination when I took my research outside, that gave me a whole different perspective because you're able to have encounters with these beings and breakthroughs and non-breakthrough encounters. But then you're able to see these entities move away from you in otherwise consensus reality, you know, going up into the sky as a sort of large, strangely configured transparent mass and and, it, and it's visible because of it, it, its un, uncommon density you know I mean it's made of something that we're not familiar with seeing in, in everyday life mind stuff so they they were examples other examples would be there's times when there's times when these things can like plunge into the room you know, or, or impact the ground. So I've been outside and, and smoked and something's like slammed into the ground around me or, you know, I've been in the room and it's plunged into the room. And then when it's going through that phase of, of imposing itself, you can hear it, you can feel it imposing against the bedroom walls and the bedroom walls are like just, the, these are plasterboard walls, creaking, flexing and groaning. So, and, and, and I would have to say it's through, doing repeated experiences that you start to become familiar with those mechanics. I mean, it took me ages to work this out. It wasn't like, right. Yep. A couple of experiences, right. I've got that. It took me such a long time. And, you know, I'm, I've, I know enough to remain open-minded, but once I kind of got that model figured in my mind, every other experience that followed, I was able to fit it into that model and, the experience has changed. They're not just visual experiences. They can be invasive experiences. And I don't mean invasive in a coercive manner, but the entities can invest a portion of themselves within you and you can have them rummaging about in your stomach. You can have them knotting up in your, around your sternum. I've had them either around my trachea or in my trachea slowly stymieing my capacity to breathe and and it, it's a really un, when you're home alone and smoking dmt and that happens you know you're in the bedroom the bedroom's full of this mind stuff there's something in you and it's slowly i don't know constricting your capacity to breathe and you start to then worry you know and and think god i might die here 
and then when you're on the verge of panic, and panic, you know, I mean, proper panic, a horrible thing for a human to panic. You're on the verge of panic and then it goes just like that. And you feel, wow, God, I'm so glad I'm alive. <laughs> so, I mean, they've got a whole host of tricks, these entities. It's not just the visual stuff, but, you know, the, the capacity they have to work with their body of mind to create illusions of motion, movement, uh, invasive aspects. I, I've had, you know, would you believe I've, I've, I've had back massages as good as anybody's ever given me whilst laid on my back. But I've also had like, you know, I'm going to say brain massages, you know, physically. And, it's, and, and I've had the lightest touch imaginable, but I've also had, I've had experiences where uh, the entities arrived and I, I don't know, I hope I can convey this, but it's kind of like, I don't know, I guess it's sort of bunched up or compressed some of my, my mind stuff. And it started to press down upon me. And I tell you, I've never experienced power or strength like it. It's like, wow, you, it's like, you know, relative to our physical strength, they're way, way, way beyond it. You know, that, that power, if, if, if I'd not had that cushing of my astral fluidic, you know, um, substance to be there, you feel like you'd just be squashed flat. I mean, extreme power. I mean, whatever your, whatever your theories on it are, there have been enough studies and formal studies. I think it was 2018, Royal College were doing, were doing clinical studies into it um, with very small doses, but they were, they were in a clinical setting with, with official, official kind of gui guidance and, and guidelines. And then, you know, so, so it's kind of as, uh, as above board as you, as you can expect something like that to be. And they were coming out with reports saying that it was, it was as close to replicating the model of a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience that that they can that they can that they can come to. And so, even if hypothetically speaking, you remove the external being, then the the other entities out of the equation, hypothetically speaking. And you assume that you take the assumption that it is purely all in and controlled by and projected by your own mind and your own yeah. consciousness. Even yeah. if you take that, that standpoint on it, the ability for you to give your mind, your brain, effectively your body, which is all it is, that additional vision, the additional sight, the additional power, the additional ability to, to do other things, to see things, to make life changes. It's the same with psilocybin. You can, you can, I've had a back problem for 10 years and reach a point where all of a sudden you realize, hey, I slouch or, I mean, that, that's too obvious, but there's, there's a little moment of clarity where you realize actually, I've done something wrong, or that's why I've got this problem. And actually you can, you can adjust yourself. So even if you take all the other things out of it, which no one's doing, but even yeah. if you do, the ability to, for it to transform your mind on such a significant level yeah. is, is, is supernatural unto itself. Oh, look, I'm absolutely on board with that. Absolutely. I mean, look, uh, many times I've, I've smoked DMT in the garden, you know, uh, I might be going through a breakthrough. I might be going through a sub breakthrough. I might get what I want. I might get a big fat surprise, but I've smoked many times in the garden, laid back, you know, cloudy sky. And, and, and that stuff that projects from you is clearly visible. You can see it filling the local sky, you know, okay. Done it enough times, no entity arrives, but that, that projection from you filling the local sky is, is clearly visible. And many times I, I've done that and I've thought, my God, I mean, even without entities, 
this is unbelievable. You know, the, 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 let's say the volume of, of immaterial substance that's hidden within, within us, it is phenomenal. I've seen it spiraling out of me. And, and, I, and, and, and I'm in a mind frame, just as I am now, as lucid as I am talking to you. But I've seen that mind stuff spiraling out of me like a, a, a huge torrent filled with, I mean, it's transparent, but it's filled with geometric shapes. And you think this should be like phenomenally exciting to science. You know, science ought to be all over this because it can't just be me that lays down having smoked DMT on a clear sunny day and sees that stuff emanating from me. Other people surely see it. But you know, you know what's interesting, Mark, is this I, I don't I don't feel like we're discovering something new. I feel like we're rediscovering something that our ancestors knew all too well about. I mean just read and I mean I'm reading so widely trying I feel like I'm trying to like pin the tail on the donkey with with who are these DMT entities because there's the in esoteric and occult literature uh, and theology you've got so many options and and recently I, I came across some uh, some documents on uh, daemon demons you know not not demons as according to Islam and Christianity but how they're midway between man and God and they share human affections but also have divine power and I was reading this and I thought my god this just ticks the boxes but you know when you post something about demons on social media it's kind of like whoa you know it's kind of like I don't know maybe maybe it's a rabbit hole too far for some people but I'm not interested in what other people, as we spoke earlier about my work, I just want to pursue what I believe is my line of inquiry to the truth, taking as many references I can find to support that and publish something that I hope people will enjoy. Whether or not we like to admit it, we're all restricted somewhat by the confines and parameters set by our culture and society. We all like to regard ourselves as free thinkers not tied in to a mass-produced ideology or national zeitgeist. Most of us in the world of paranormal and supernatural research would think we have broken away from the restraints of what we're expected to think. We are the outsiders, pushing from one small corner to further the global truth. But we're a minority, and most of us are still under the umbrella of deceit and misinformation fed to us by the powers that be. There's a global acceptance for religion of all denominations. Saying prayer to a being unseen is accepted. No man nor woman nor child is shunned or ridiculed for such things. Change the prayer and the God for a chant and an ultra-terrestrial entity and you're soon pushing the boundaries of people's acceptance. One could drink any amount of alcohol quite legally and whilst not advised and a little foolish it would be recognised by society as quite the normal thing to do. But what of the illegal substance? Because our laws, our society, our culture dictates that such things are prosecutable, wrong, immoral, they're pushed from our world. They may not always be safe and they may not be regulated, nor perhaps will they ever be or should they be. But what benefits to the advancement of human consciousness and the greater truths of the universe they are will remain largely unknown. Studies are carried out, and the results mapped and logged and analysed, but it's left to a small, darkened pocket of society to keep alive a practice and a spirituality which predates any law. There is a, a, a quiet, psychedelic revolution taking place, but in, in terms of mainstream, it's still very much taboo. So I'm like dealing with one taboo there, and then I'm, I'm using the word occult in my title and my research, and that's very much a taboo-addled word. And I purposefully chose it because I think an occult interpretation will ultimately prove to be the most accurate and the most meaningful. But I also wanted to try and go some way to rehabilitating that word because it's all it's not all about dark, nefarious practices. There are some really wonderful global philosophies, you know, in, in every nation that talk about these realms, otherworldly beings, etc. Yeah, if I'm going to... The Bible is the most occult book. In yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the sayings of, of Jesus, 
you know, whoever he was, a deeply occult. I mean, faith move, moves mountains. That's a deeply occult phrase. You know, the science behind that is deeply occult. But then if I'm going to start bringing demons into it, then that's that's another taboo. But you know what? I mean, you know, I, I came across uh, one of the definitions for demons and uh, it means replete with wisdom. And once I'd read that, I was like, oh, that's like I feel like I'm really getting the ability to sort of pin the tail on the right place of the donkey. <laughs> I'm getting somewhere at last. By far, the vast majority of my experiences have been wonderful, playful, beyond my wildest imaginations. I have laughed like I, I didn't think human beings could laugh like that. So scary stories, a few are far between, and I guess they're what some people will call bad trips, but I don't like the phrase bad trips. I prefer challenging trips because these are the kind of experiences that you you learn from. You learn about the the, the experience. You learn about yourself. And um, I, I sometimes wonder whether these challenging experiences put there as an obstacle to be overcome to to advance your own sort of journey. And that's that's how I viewed it. You know, I've had an entity in me, and it's you can feel it rummaging about inside you, and the experience is going on and on and on. And you're thinking, oh my God, is, is this thing trapped? And you know, it, 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 they kind of know what you're thinking, you know. And you're thinking, my God, this this thing's trapped. And it's like, for some reason, the tree outside is kind of, I can sense it's looking at me and, and it's worried. It's thinking, oh my God, this poor human man, he's got this thing trapped inside him. And then this thing's going crazy. He's trying to find a way out. And again, you're on the verge of, of horrible panic. I mean, your psyche collapsing. It's gone. So I'm in this little room where I write my books and it's a sun, it's a Saturday and it's foggy. There's no air movement and it, it's just not my, it's not, it's not the kind of atmosphere I will smoke DMT in. It's a no. But I, I think something, I don't know, I, I guess something is subliminally coaxing me into smoking DMT and it's about 4 p.m and against my better judgment I load a pipe and it's just 15 milligram it's nothing you know I, I say it's nothing you know never underestimate DMT and I go outside into the garden put a blanket down etc and it's foggy and I sit up and it's one pole and I lay back it's just one token lay back and god damn it this thing is there and when I say this thing it's like it's disc shaped. It's about say two, two and a half meters wide. It's disc shaped. I can see it, but I can see right through it, you know, and it within, it just comes straight down to me. It's like, it's been waiting for me. You know, it knew I was going to do this. Come straight down to me. Uh, I was able to somehow intuit and, and perceive that this thing was made of constructible pieces, like, um, like a 3d puzzle. And some portion of this thing just went right into my forehead, right into my brain. And it did something, you know, that I, I could feel the sort of, when I say physical activity, I mean, these things can operate in a quasi-physical or paraphysical, if you prefer, manner. It did something in my brain. Then it came out and this thing just shot off. And that was it. And I was left. And it all happened so quick. It was very clear what had happened, you know, how I described it. But what wasn't clear is what the hell has that thing just done to my brain? And now this sort of dark, brooding worry befell me. I'm like, I, I felt like I'd been tripped and I don't want to say psychically raped but I, I, I some it done a number on me I was like geez what's it done and, and I had very uh, two, two or three very dark hours worrying you know 
what's he done? You know, thinking in in years to come, is a switch gonna flick in my head? Am I gonna do something that's out out of character? You know, you you hear people commit heinous crimes, and then they're saying, "Oh, something came over me," or you know, I wasn't in my right mind, and I'm I'm like soaking in the bath, and like thinking, I can't go to the hospital and say, "Look, I've smoked DMT." This thing came down. I think it had, I think it had tricked me into smoking DMT. It came down and it did something. I can tell you where about it's in my brain. It did it, but I don't know what it's done. Can you, can you take it out? Of, can you, can you undo what it's done? I mean, be like, you know, be straight to the kind of like, you know. Yeah, you wouldn't be coming straight home, would you? You know, yeah, you know, like I, I <laughs> take him to a different hospital and. Um, you know that, that's the thing with these experiences and these substances in terms of it, how it can change your life now I, I i had a choice there i could say and it could have been very dark i could say i am never smoking that substance ever again and worry every day of my life about what may or may not happen and what it may or may not have done but after like soaking the bath i, I kind of thought about it and i realized that those two to three hours of deep dark brooding the entity had, that was its trick that was its ruse that's what it had set out to do and it had done it so beautifully at least i hope that's right and then I, you know and, but, but i was able to sort of come out then and like go wow you got me real good and you know what's what's really interesting these kind of challenging experience and i've, I've had one similar to that these are qualitatively very different entities to the ones that I'm, I'm used to dealing with. I mean, these um, seem to really sort of test you. And I've only well, had a few... Feeding off the negativity? Well, no, I, I wouldn't say it was feeding off my negativity. I, it just seemed to have a capacity to really... I mean, it, it put me on a very dark downward spiral for two to three hours and i think it knew exactly what it was going to do just a trickster what's, what's more serious is it if i'd you know said that's it i'm finished with dmt but gone through life worrying about something that may or may not have happened in my brain you know it's only by kind of like being determined and strong-willed and saying you know what i do know my own mind that's not going to be my last dmt experience i will be back i mean i've had challenging experiences that have left me flabbergasted but i've had to you know when the entity's gone i've had to kind of like look up at the sky and sort of give a thumbs up or a yeah you got me you got me real good but i will be back <laughs> i think that's kind of mindset that that you kind of need to pursue these experiences yeah. Not for the faint-hearted, and I'm not saying I'm a an alpha male of the psychedelic world. Far from it. I mean, these are not easy experiences to commit to, and I have been. I have. I'm. I'm proud to say I've been a hero many times, but I'm. I'm equally not abashed to say I've been a coward just as many times. You know, the opportunity to smoke DMT has been there. Nobody at home. You know, perfect conditions, and the thoughts went to smoke DMT enters my mind and I've said no way that's the craziest goddamn thing in the world I am touching it today so everything is available on on Amazon or direct from me when I say direct from me I've got I've got a um, presence on social media it's all DMT researcher so Facebook is dmt.researcher Twitter's dmt underscore researcher and Instagram is DMT researcher, so you know I'm, I'm available there. My news last last year was Graham Hancock made me his author of the year in November, and that that was so unexpected. I, I it's still not sunk in, you know, because I, I was kind of the author after the Immortality Key, which is just a phenomenally good book, and I'm just you know I'm still kind of like floating on air from that. Like wow, I. I, I followed the, the immortality key. So, yeah, um, third book, I'm not in any rush. Uh, I will only publish it if I consider it to be equal or, or 
or better than and i'm aiming for better than books one and two uh, within that i'll include ayahuasca experiences which i've had and i hope to pursue further but also experiences with um, bufo alvarius the toad medicine which you know i'm several experiences into that and wow that that's you know that's a, that's got to be a whole nother podcast well, you're gonna to have to come back then aren't you? When you yeah yeah i mean that 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 is that's a different ball game altogether <laughs> i want to hear about all of it for sure okay yeah but I'm, I'm really enjoying the writing i'm really enjoying the research whether it's literary research or <laughs> to say i enjoy the practical research doesn't seem i i do but you know i'm not gonna see say oh yeah i, I love that toad medicine that's that's <laughs> That, that's take some commitment to on there. Yeah, we'll leave that there. <laughs> yeah, fine, fine, fine. Cool. It's been an absolute joy to, to speak with you. I'm fascinated to hear where you're going to be going next. I want to hear all about the toad medicine. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat with us tonight. Um, it, it's been a joy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson, as part of the Fearscape Media Network. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash Peer Beyond the Veil or on Twitter at Peer Beyond the Veil or at Peer Beyond 2020. Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people 